Hey, I'm Dr. Austin Slade. I'm a urologist in Boise, Idaho, and fellowship trained in BPH and the HOLIP procedure, which I'll be talking to you about today. If you're watching this video, it likely means that a prostate procedure is a consideration for you. There are a lot of options with uh, different nuances, but hopefully through watching this video, I can help make that decision a lot easier for you. So HOLIP stands for Homium Laser Enucleation of the Prostate, which has reference to the type of laser that's being used, a homium laser in this case, and what's happening to the prostate, enucleation. In order to best understand what this entails, it's easiest to compare it to other procedures so that you can really compare and contrast to what sets this procedure apart. Now we've touched on this in other videos, but a uh, quick recap, the prostate is this gland that sits here at the base of the bladder, and right at the end of the prostate is where we find our main sphincter muscle or urinary control muscle. You can see that's a little bit out of the way, but is in close proximity to the prostate. To help conceptualize what's happening to the prostate with these various procedures, it's really helpful to think of the prostate like an orange with an outer peel along the outside and inner pulp. You can see here that there's this outer peel. We also refer to that as the capsule of the prostate and then inner pulp-like material um, or the fruit of the, the orange. Um, all of the procedures that are being done to improve urinary symptoms, uh, and that's important to bring up that this is not a cancer surgery, um, all of the prostate procedures that exist are aiming at minimizing or reducing how that pulp is squeezing on the urethra and impairing your urinary symptoms. One of the classic procedures that's still commonly performed today is a TERP or transurethral resection of the prostate. And what that entails is taking little pieces bit by bit, starting from the inside until we slowly widen up the channel there as we scoop away prostate tissue and we create a wider channel for that urine to pass through unobstructed by this prostate. There's another laser out there called a green light laser, which essentially performs the same thing to the prostate, but now this laser vaporizes uh, that, that obstructive tissue rather than scooping it away piece by piece, by piece like we do with the TERP. You may also come across a procedure called aqua ablation, where water is used under high pressure and sprayed away, sprays away some of that inner tissue. Again, just aiming to widen that channel to ease the flow of urine out of the bladder. Another procedure is resume, where steam is injected into that fruit or that pulp of the prostate, which over time uh, shrinks the prostate and widens that channel for the urine to flow. And finally, a procedure that's uh, falling out of popularity is Urolift, where clips, um, permanent implantable clips are placed inside the prostate in an effort to pin that tissue back and, and pull the prostate open. Now, while many men may experience good, at least initial improvement in their urinary symptoms and flow following any number of these techniques, one of the problems inherent to all of them is that it leaves some of that pulp or what we call adenoma behind. And anytime any of that pulp tissue is left behind, it has the potential to regrow and reobstruct the prostate. Of course, there is some nuance between each of the procedures that I mentioned, but overall, there's as much as a 10 to 30% retreatment rate in as little as five to 10 years following those surgeries. So how does HOLIP compare to this? Well, HOLIP is an enucleation of the prostate. That's what the E in HOLIP stands for. And that's just a fancy word for peeling. So with HOLUP, we use the homium laser to unpeel the prostate right where the pulp of it meets the peel. We do that all the way around on both sides so that the entirety of the pulp is removed, leaving just the peel behind. At the end of the procedure, we're now left with a maximally unobstructive prostate that uh, the bladder may empty with ease through. The urine no longer face any, faces any resistance as it, as it leaves the bladder and passes down into the urethra. Uh, there is just one component to, to address, and that is the prostate tissue that we had unpeeled and is now floating inside the bladder. We use a separate instrument called a morselator, which essentially just 
turns that into little tiny pieces and sucks or pulls it out of the bladder. Um, all of those pieces are then sent for biopsy to the pathologist to review. One of the areas where the hole-up procedure really stands out is in its durability. Whereas the others that we had mentioned have that 10 to 30% retreatment rate in as little as five to 10 years, with hole-up, we're looking at less than 2% of men requiring retreatment in as many as 20 years after. And we've been doing that, this surgery for that long. Uh, so for most men, what that means really is this would be the only procedure that they need for the rest of their life. If you're anything like me, you may be saying to yourself, well, that just makes sense. Why doesn't everyone just unpeel the prostate or offer this hole-up procedure? And the truth of that is, for several reasons. One, it's a very challenging procedure to learn. There are very few sites that offer training for it, and it does not pay urologists well for their time to offer it. So that incentive to push people through the process just isn't quite there. But I saw this as something that I wanted to be able to offer to patients. It's what I would choose for myself or for my family. In fact, what a panel or what a room of urologists, the majority would have chosen this procedure for themselves as well. Um, and so I took it upon myself to go through one of these fellowships, these training programs for two years, worked with the world experts at uh, Indiana University, where this procedure first started in the United States. And I'm fortunate to be able to offer this now to my patients. There's a very wide variety of reasons for why someone might be wanting to undergo a procedure for their prostate. Uh, perhaps it's you're going too frequently, you're having a hard time initiating the stream, the stream's very weak, um, you're dealing with really bothersome urgency or even a leakage of urine because of the urge to urinate. You're up too, you're, uh, up too many times at night, that's really interfering with your quality of life. Or perhaps you're dependent on a, a urinary catheter in order to empty your bladder. You know, whatever the reasons, fortunately, Holup is one of those uh, one-size-fits-all solutions. Uh, but the expected results of the procedure can vary a bit depending on what types of symptoms you have coming into this and will be an important and individualized discussion that we will hold. Another one of the areas where the Holup procedure really shines is for those patients who might be dependent on a urinary catheter. 98 to 99% of them will be able to urinate again after undergoing this procedure. Whereas with other techniques, we're looking at, at best 80 to 85% chance of success. So because of how completely and how well it unobstructs the bladder, there's a very high success rate at being able to urinate again. Nothing is without its potential risk. So let's go over what those are for hole up. First is seeing blood in the urine. Any of the procedures that we mentioned, you may expect to see some blood in the urine, and that's the case for Holup as well. You know, that blood can last for a few days and can be seen off and on for several weeks. Um, what is a benefit, uh, another benefit of the Holup is that it is the least likely to um, require a blood transfusion or have significant blood loss compared to some of the resective techniques that I mentioned earlier, like that TERP procedure or aqua ablation. So the hole up is one of the very few procedures that can be safely performed in patients who are on blood thinners because of just how well the bleeding can be controlled. Another potential risk is for the development of temporary leakage of urine. This can happen in about 30 to 40% of patients uh, in the initial weeks or sometimes few months after the procedure. It's usually small volume when it does occur, like drips or dribbles, but it may be important to keep some pads or depends on hand for the, the first uh, little while after the recovery period, just until you feel comfortable if you have any, how much you have and that it's resolved. Um, we can think of this happening because of the relationship that the sphincter has next to the prostate. There can be some strain placed on that muscle during the procedure. And that's where the technique um, really comes into play, you know, given the surgeon's background and, and, and comfort level with this procedure to offer a sparing technique on the sphincter to really minimize that leakage. Using smaller instruments may also help to reduce the degree of leakage that, that one experiences. Um, fortunately, we know that, like I mentioned, it is temporary, only a 1% risk that anyone develops lasting leakage of urine. And truthfully, that's the same risk that we see with other procedures such as TERP that uh, has long been performed as the alternative to this procedure. 
And finally, no discussion on BPH procedures would be complete without discussing the impact that it may have on sexual function. So something very important to, to note is that none of the techniques mentioned, including the whole up, will change a man's erectile function. Whatever erectile function they have before, they will continue to have after. None of these will impair the ability to climax or orgasm. Um, but what can change and may be permanent depending on how or what is chosen is the, uh, the direction of the flow of the ejaculate or the fluid that comes out at the time of climax. When done in the complete fashion, it would be expected that a man would have dry or retrograde ejaculation after the hole-up procedure, much like they would experience with some of the other techniques such as TERP. So the erectile function is preserved, the ability to orgasm or climax is preserved, but no fluid would come out. It, it would be a dry or what we call a retrograde ejaculation. And what I can't answer for you is, would that be bothersome? What we know is when you ask a, a group of men on average, they don't find any change in the satisfaction uh, that they have with their intimacy. Um, but there can be, there, or there rather, uh, better said, there is a percentage of men, um, my experience 10 to 20% or so, who feel like maybe the strength or the quality of that climax has diminished because of that loss of the flow that has come out. And you may have experienced this already with some of the medications that you may be on for BPH since that's one of the side effects that they can cause dry or retrograde ejaculation. And this occurs because the ejaculate, it enters the urethra at a point kind of right here, right at the, the end of the prostate. Um, and the outward flow of the ejaculate is dependent on this region of the prostate kind of closing down and, and permitting that fluid to flow. So whether you're on a medication to relax this area of the prostate or you had a procedure that removed this region of the prostate, there will no longer be that supportive uh, area there keeping that flow coming outward and instead it will flow backward, mix in with the urine and would be eliminated the next time you urinated. Now it's not harmful or dangerous, but it is different and in many cases can be permanent. And we can't put tissue back after it's already been removed. So if you think that this is something that may be bothersome to you or that you would want to avoid, then we can have a detailed plan about how we can attempt or, or do our best to preserve and maintain that function for you. And depending on your prostate size and shape, this may mean either modifying the hole-up surgery so that we are uh, maintaining or, or preserving that area of the prostate that is uh, critical for that outward flow of ejaculate. Uh, or we may utilize another procedure such as resume, that steam therapy that can preserve ejaculation or uh, a balloon dilation within the prostate, a drug-coated balloon called Octoloom BPH. So I will work with you to find out which of these options might be the best for you, especially depending on you know, your willingness of, of having this happen um, and also the balance of improving your urinary symptoms. Something that all of these procedures have in common is that a Foley catheter or a urinary catheter would be placed in the bladder at the end of the surgery. What does vary is how long that catheter has to be in place. For most of the other procedures I mentioned, averages uh, usually one to three days where that catheter needs to stay in there to help the bladder drain while some recovery or that initial inflammation resolves. With hole up, one of the really nice features because of just how well we're unobstructing the bladder is that catheter can be removed the same day. So while you're uh, recovering, once you, you feel awake and able to stand up on your feet, usually about an hour to an hour and a half after the procedure, that catheter can be removed. We would allow you to, to have a, a trial of urinating and so long as that's successful, then you're able to return home that same day catheter free, which is something no other procedure can offer. Um, we select that option. Usually about 80 to 90% of my patients may, may opt for that. There can be some reasons uh, why I might suggest we keep it a little bit longer, 
But for those who are motivated to go home without the catheter, there's about a 90% success rate at successfully doing so. So a small chance that in spite of our best efforts, maybe it's just not quite ready. A catheter would have to be placed temporarily and the next day it's well over 95 to 99% success rate. Essentially, you could count on that catheter coming out the next day. So what to expect around the time of surgery? You know, most men tell me the next day that they feel a lot better than they expected. And in large part, that's likely because this is all done telescopically right through the urethra. So there's no incisions. Uh, we don't have to cut your skin or muscles in order to get this out. So you're just not sore like you might think you would be with a, a traditional surgery. It doesn't hurt to move. It doesn't hurt to sit or stand or walk. So how soon can you resume your regular activities and what are some of the restrictions or limitations after this? Well, that in part depends on what your regular activities are. So for most patients, you will be able to walk, drive, and resume all the, the minor chores around the house. Um, I recommend waiting about two weeks before running again or performing any vigorous exercise, riding a horse, golfing. Um, but for most men, it'll be just a period of about a week that I would suggest you hold off on lifting anything more than 20 pounds or going on a long walk or a, or a strenuous hike. If you're working at a desk or at home or your job doesn't require real, real heavy lifting or strenuous activity, then in many instances, you'll be fine to resume work as early as the next day. Um, I've had patients travel as early as a week after surgery, but rather than being limited from pain or discomfort, you're more likely to be just limited by uh, feeling a stronger need to urinate or more urgently or frequently than what might have been normal for you before the surgery. Uh, this is particularly common within the first week or two after the surgery and usually uh, improves significantly in time. Um, and by that three month point after surgery, most of those uh, initial symptoms have well resolved. And finally, there are just a couple rare but longer term potential risks that uh, scarring could develop anywhere along the urinary tract. Now, this is the same risk across the board, no matter what, what uh, surgery procedure you have done, that anytime instruments go through the urethra, there's about a less than 2% risk that some scarring could form um, within the urethra or around where that, that uh, prostate meets the bladder that could require a, an additional therapy to resolve. So now we know what the hole-up procedure is, how it compares to other prostate procedures, what the risks and benefits are, and kind of what to expect around the time of surgery. Well, now's the time where I would like to answer any questions that you may have had during this video, and we can work to see if this is the right solution for you.